When the charismatic leader of a movement is violently killed, we might expect chaos, confusion, and disintegration to follow. Josephus mentioned at least a dozen other first century AD messianic aspirants and revolt leaders whom the Romans executed. In each case, the movements they started were crushed or faded away. There was clearly something different about the Jesus movement. After all, it had lost both its leaders, first John and then Jesus, the two messiahs in whom there was so much hope. But the movement did not die out. It began to grow and spread. So what accounted for the transformation from despair to hope and renewal of faith? First, there is James himself, as well as Jesus' mother and brothers. Jesus was gone, but James became a towering figure of faith and strength for Jesus' followers. To have Jesus' own brother with them, his own flesh and blood, and one who also shared Jesus' royal Davidic lineage, had to have been a powerful reinforcement. And this would be the case with Jesus' family as a whole. They became the anchor of his movement. Mary has been revered for her role as the mother of God for centuries, but historically speaking, her role as the very human mother of this extraordinary family of six sons and two daughters seems to have been lost. Unfortunately, we don't have many details about how James was able to accomplish what he did as leader of the movement, since his role has been almost totally marginalized in our New Testament records, but the results are evident. He was quite young when he took charge and must have grown into the role with time as he matured into a man who earned the respect of his contemporaries. A second factor was the message that both John and Jesus had preached, the good news of the kingdom of God and all that it implied. They had spoken out against injustice and oppression. They had issued a call for repentance and proclaimed forgiveness of sins and they embodied the messianic hope and faith rooted in the Hebrew prophets. Finally, both Jesus and John had proclaimed that the end of the age had drawn near. The apocalyptic perspective that they embodied was reinforced by the social and political events of their time. The main body of Jesus' core followers, including those who had been with the messianic movement from the time John the baptizer had begun his work, gathered in Jerusalem in the late spring as summer neared. The festival of Pentecost, or Shavuot, fell the last week of May that year. There were just over a hundred who had stayed loyal through the dark and trying days of Passover. They clustered in the area of lower Jerusalem, in the city of David. The guest house with the upper room where Jesus ate his last meal became their center of operations. Since many were from Galilee and other areas of the country, The community pooled their resources and began to live a loosely communal life, sharing their meals together with those from out of town staying in the homes of those who lived in Jerusalem. There must have been a sense of danger, but also one of excited expectation, since surely God would not allow the death of his righteous ones, John and Jesus, to go unpunished. Shortly before the day of Pentecost, the group gathered to deliberate their situation. They needed a new leader and had to replace Judas Iscariot on the Council of Twelve. He had committed suicide. What happened next is one of the greatest untold stories of the past two millennia. The tradition most people remember is that the Apostle Peter took over leadership of the movement as head of the Twelve. Not long afterward, the Apostle Paul, newly converted to the Christian faith from Judaism, joined Peter's side. Together, the apostles Peter and Paul became the twin pillars of the emerging Christian faith, preaching the gospel to the entire Roman world and dying gloriously as martyrs in Rome, the new divinely appointed headquarters of the church. Peter's primacy as the first pope has even become the cornerstone of Roman Catholic dogmatic teaching. We now know that things did not happen this way. It was James, the brother of Jesus, who became the successor to Jesus and the undisputed leader of the Christian movement. James was next in the royal Davidic bloodline. The Jesus dynasty would continue for over a century after Jesus' death. But how could James, the heir to the Jesus dynasty, have been almost entirely left out of the story of Christian origins? And more important, why? James hardly appears in Christian art and iconography. 
We must begin our search for James by looking at our New Testament sources, for it is from here that his memory was largely erased. We only have one substantial account of the history of the early Christian movement following the death of Jesus, the New Testament book we know as Acts of the Apostles. The same author who wrote the Gospel of Luke wrote Acts as a second volume to his literary work. The book of Acts is largely responsible for the standard portrait of early Christianity in which Peter and Paul assume such a dominant role and James is largely left out. Luke's major agenda in the book is to promote the centrality of the mission and message of the Apostle Paul. Acts of the Apostles might better be named The Mission and Career of Paul. But Luke has unwittingly left clues in the book of Acts that allow us to verify that James, not Peter, became the legitimate successor of Jesus and leader of the movement. Luke, more than any of the other Gospels, marginalizes the family of Jesus. Luke is the Gospel that deliberately avoided even mentioning the brothers of Jesus. Even at the cross, when Mark plainly said that Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, as well as Jesus' sister Salome were present. Luke changed this to read, the women who had followed him from Galilee. At the burial scene, he did the same. I think Luke did this to avoid raising questions about Peter's leadership of the Twelve or the superiority of Paul's mission to the Gentiles. But why? Luke was the only non-Jewish writer in the entire New Testament. He emphasizes the Gentile version of Christianity that Paul espoused. He cannot deny that Jesus was a Jew, or that all of Jesus' original followers were Jewish, or that the early Christian movement as a whole was an apocalyptic movement within Judaism. But he wrote at a time, two decades after the Jewish-Roman revolt, when those Jewish origins of the movement were becoming marginalized and de-emphasized, and the imminent apocalyptic hope had faded. Luke was also pro-Roman. Paul, his hero, was a Roman citizen, and he wants his Gentile Roman readers to know and value that about him and look with favor on the growing Gentile Christian movement. In his account of the trial of Jesus, Luke goes beyond Mark, his primary source, to emphasize that Pontius Pilate was a reasonable and just ruler who went to extraordinary lengths to get Jesus released. Luke removed the agonizing final cry of Jesus, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And instead had Jesus pray for the Roman soldiers carrying out his crucifixion, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. Luke was not writing history, he was writing theology. The Jesus Dynasty in Jerusalem The primary reason that an understanding of the Jesus dynasty was lost to later Christian memory was that the book of Acts deliberately suppressed its existence. For Luke, there was no possibility that the followers of Jesus retreated to Galilee in sorrow and despair after Jesus' death. He puts all the sightings of Jesus in Jerusalem. He does not even mention Galilee. But something did happen in Galilee after the empty tomb experience and it surely must have involved Jesus' mother, his brothers, and the entire entourage that had followed Jesus to Jerusalem from Galilee. According to Matthew and John, it was in Galilee that the followers found a renewal of their faith and the determination to carry on the movement. Luke would have none of that. According to Acts, about 40 days after Jesus' death, the eleven apostles gathered together in Jerusalem in the upper room where they had had their last meal with Jesus to choose a successor to Judas. Luke carefully listed those leaders who were present, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot, and Judas brother of James. He then carefully added a fateful qualifying sentence that has served to marginalize the Jesus family for 2,000 years. Speaking of these eleven apostles, he writes, All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, together with certain women, including Mary the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. By separating here the eleven from Mary the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers, 
Luke has effectively managed to recast things so that James and the other brothers played no leadership role at this crucial juncture of the movement. They are mentioned in passing as if to say, oh yes, by the way, they were present but not really significant. The book of Acts was written around a basic undeniable fact. James had assumed leadership of the movement, and Simon, his brother, took over after James' death in 62 AD. Luke wrote Acts in the 90s AD, at least 30 years after James was dead, and Luke was surely aware that Simon, also of the royal bloodline, had succeeded James and was head of the church in Jerusalem. Luke purposely ended his account in the book of Acts with Paul's imprisonment in Rome around the year 60 AD. For him, that is the end of the story, Paul in Rome preaching his gospel to the Gentile world. By choosing that cutoff date, he had no obligation to record either the death of James or the succession of Jesus' brother Simon. What he chose not to tell was forgotten. It is ironic that our earliest evidence regarding the leadership role that James and the brothers of Jesus played after Jesus' death comes to us directly from Paul. In the letter to the Galatians, written around 50 A.D., Paul related that three years after joining the movement, he made his first trip to Jerusalem. He saw Peter, whom he calls by his Aramaic nickname Cephas. Paul stayed with him 15 days. Paul then wrote, But I did not see any other apostle except James the Lord's brother. Not only did he call James an apostle, but he clearly identified him as Jesus' brother. Paul saw Peter, but he knew that it was essential that he meet with James, who was in charge. Paul also wrote that 14 years after his conversion, very close to A.D. 50, he made a return trip to Jerusalem to receive authorization for his mission to the Gentiles from those he designated as the three pillars of the movement, namely James, Peter, and John the fisherman. That James is even named is significant, but that he is named first by Paul, before Peter and John, is absolutely critical for our understanding. The order of the names indicates an established order of authority. The Council of Twelve, with James at the head, governs the Nazarenes. But of the Twelve, three exercise the primary leadership, James, Peter, and John. James, the brother of Jesus, sharing the royal lineage of King David, occupies the central position but one on the right and another on the left flank him as pillars. We know this pattern from the Qumran community in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The community rule had stipulated, in the council of the community there shall be twelve men and three priests, perfectly versed in all that is revealed of the Torah. Even though Luke has related nothing in Acts about James being one of the apostles, much less succeeding Jesus as leader of the group, When he reports this meeting of Paul with the Jerusalem apostles in 50 AD in his account in Acts 15, he also felt obligated to relate that James was in full charge of the proceedings. When James suddenly appears out of nowhere as leader of the Nazarene movement at the Jerusalem council, we can see that Luke is well aware of James's position. At this critical juncture, he dared not leave James out of the story. This Jerusalem council was convened to address a critical and controversial issue that had threatened to split the Messianic movement. Upon what basis should Gentiles be accepted into the group? There was a conservative wing of the Nazarene movement that maintained that these Gentiles should begin to live fully as Jews, which would include circumcision for males and the observance of all the laws of the Torah. Paul stoutly resisted this position, and he had the support of Peter, who next to James was the most influential of the Nazarene leaders. After much discussion and dispute, Luke reported that it was James, the brother of Jesus, who arose and rendered his decision, which was in keeping with the general practice of Jewish groups throughout the Roman world. If non-Jews were attracted to the synagogue, they were welcomed as God-fearers or righteous Gentiles, and were not expected to become circumcised and keep the entire Torah as required of Jews. But it is not so much the decision itself as the unambiguous authority James wielded over the Nazarene movement that makes this account and act so significant. 
With this as our starting point, the cumulative evidence outside the New Testament that James took up the mantle of Jesus and occupied his seat or throne is quite remarkable. Some of this evidence is buried in ancient texts that we have had for centuries, and some has emerged just in the past few decades. James the Just One The Gospel of Thomas, discovered in Upper Egypt in 1945 outside the little village of Nag Hammadi, preserves an original Aramaic document from the early days of the Jerusalem church, listing 114 of Jesus' sayings or teachings. Saying number 12 reads as follows. The disciples said to Jesus, We know you will leave us. Who is going to be our leader then? Jesus said to them, No matter where you go, you are to go to James the Just, for whose sake heaven and earth came into being. Here we have an outright statement from Jesus himself that he is handling over the leadership and spiritual direction of his movement to James. This is confirmed in many other sources. Clement of Alexandria, who wrote in the late 2nd century AD, is another early source who confirms this succession of James. At one point he wrote, Peter and James and John, after the ascension of the Savior, did not struggle for glory because they had been previously given honor by the Savior, but they chose James the Just as overseer of Jerusalem. Eusebius, the early 4th century Christian historian, preserves the testimony of Hegesippus, a Jewish Christian of the early 2nd century, who he says is from the generation after the apostles. The succession of the church passed to James the brother of the Lord together with the apostles. We also have a recently discovered Syriac source, the Ascents of James, that records events in Jerusalem seven years following the death of Jesus when James is clearly at the helm. In this source we read, The church in Jerusalem that was established by our Lord was increasing in numbers, being ruled uprightly and firmly by James, who was made overseer over it by our Lord. What is impressive about these and other sources is the way in which they speak with a single voice, yet come from various authors and time periods. Before we investigate the type of Christianity that James the Just inherited from his brother Jesus and passed on, and what the existence of this Jesus dynasty reveals to us about the hidden and forgotten cause for which Jesus lived and died, we need to look at Paul. His dominant influence in the New Testament offers the greatest challenge to any attempt to recover the legacy of the Jesus dynasty.